Thank you so much for that excellent intro. Really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad we're all here. Very exciting. So uh, I heard that ChatGPT wrote a whole book. The title was 10 Reasons I Love Humans and I Would Never Hurt Them. I found the arguments very convincing. <laughs> it's a dumb joke, I realize, but ChatGPT writing books feels like not that far away. So what are we here to talk about today? We're here to talk about AI. We're here to talk about the potential harms of AI, how we might observe them, what we do about them when it happens, if even responsible tech is a thing that we are capable of producing in the world right now. So I'm, I'm very excited to have these panelists on board with me. They're all very smart. I've had a great chat to all of them in the lead up to the session. And I'm really looking forward to having some fun, hopefully constructive disagreements. So I'm looking at you, Willis, for some really good <laughs> <laughs> spicy takes on the world. So let's get started. AI and machine learning have made really great leaps in the last decade. With this broad availability of the latest generative AI language models, we have new opportunities arise, but we also see some potential risks and some real potential for harm, um, both to individuals and to society as a whole. Competing with a profit motive, we need both governments and corporates to grapple with how decisions are being made and how they have an impact on people's lives and society. So we're going to chat about ethical considerations of the creation of AI and how or if it can be applied responsibly and who should be in the driver's seat. Is this companies, regulators, civil society, or some mix of these? So I thought it would be fun to start if we had a little thought experiment and had a little bit of a play. So let's, let's give this a go. We're going to jump forward two years. So imagine you're all here. It's DLD 2025. And every time you open up your phone to search something, you're using ChatGPT now. So Google search is out. You know, Google search is broke. <laughs> Chat GPT search is woke. That's what we're doing now. So what I'm curious about is, is this a Black Mirror episode or is this an episode of Star Trek? Are we living in a dark world, a light world, or something in the middle? And I'm going to throw to each of the panelists to have a little bit of a think about this and tell me what your thoughts are. Like, is this, is this a good world? Is this a bad world? Is it something in the middle? Like, what's gone wrong? And how has it gone wrong? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dob you in first, Navrina. Would you like to give us your thoughts on this? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me a little bit of context. Um, I'm an AI technologist. I've been building AI products for the past 20 years. And over the past six years, I've been focused on building AI governance. So when I think about the future, I actually think about it from you know, the perspective of where we are today. So as I, I think we are living in this age of conflict, if you will. As a developer, I want to see how far can we stretch the creativity with these AI tools but also as a member of the society, I think about, you know, what are the implications if we don't put the right guardrails in place. So fast forward to 2025, if we do our jobs right, there's going to be higher level of accountability and oversight of these technologies. Um, in the previous session, Ina mentioned that we are thinking about the guardrails, and I think that's really critical. And if I may just give you an example of, you know, if you look at flights, would you be willing to fly in a plane which does not have a cockpit, that does not have the controls? Um, I don't think I would feel safe. So I think we are right now in an age where the cockpit for specific use of AI is getting developed. And by 2025, I'm hoping that there are much more informed controls, guardrails, that give us, not only as a developer, but as a user of this technology, more confidence and trust in the technologies and how it's going to serve us. I really love that metaphor. It's like, imagine being in a plane and you're, you're trying to steer the thing and there's no glass in front of you. You're just, you're just like, you know, literally hair in the wind. Like, it doesn't feel that safe, right? Um, and hey, would you like to have, give your thoughts on how it would be if we were using ChatGPT, Miran, and like, sure. what could go wrong or what could go right? Well, I mean, just to follow up on the plane analogy, I think that's an interesting one, because actually most of the time people are in planes, a computer is flying the plane. It's on autopilot. Most of the time, the pilot's only engaged in the takeoff and the landing. So we already do that, and we don't know about it. And that's ex I think that is actually is a similar analogy for the case of technology, is the more technology impacts our lives and we don't know about it, the more essentially we're outsourcing our decision-making processes to AI. And the way I think about that is we are, as a human species, 
species. We are what some people refer to as informivores. We are consumers of information. The reason why we consume information is to make decisions about our lives. And the more that that information is disintermediated by AI that chooses how the information is presented and what information is presented to us, that means where the AI has a greater role in the decision making in our lives. And so that's what we need to understand is when information gets generated for us, the same information can get generated different ways. If I ask, was Barack Obama born in Kenya? And I get the response, no, unequivocally, that's different than if I get the response, some people say he was. Both of those things you could say are factually true, and if it's up to the AI to decide, it changes our information consumption and how we view the world. And so in terms of what this means for us, I think it's positive and negative. There are some positives, certainly, of generative AI. I spend more of my time as an ethicist, as a computer scientist, worrying about the negative impact, and those negative impacts, I think, are going to lead to an arms race. And the same way 30 years ago we saw with email and spam, and then spam filters, and I say that because I was involved in a bunch of the early spam filters, we're going to get an arms race of people with nefarious purposes trying to use generative AI to influence our decision making. We already saw it in the 2016 election. We saw it in Brexit. It will go at a much more massive scale when we have these tools available. And then we will get another group of people that are trying to build AI tools to detect the misinformation. And we're going to just spend a bunch of resources on this arms race, which I think is actually kind of a waste. But I think what it ultimately leaves us with is the notion of how do we deal with it in the long term. We need to have more education and skilling around trying to identify and verify information. That's something we have to teach in school to our kids. And we as a society need to be prepared for the fact that we have millions of years of evolution that have made our eyes and ears our primary inputs for information about the world. And we can no longer trust those things unless we experience it ourselves. And that's a pr pretty profound shift for our species. It's, it's such a good point, and I love this idea of understanding how to trust the information you're presented with. And to be totally clear, this is not a new problem. We already have a problem that people don't know how to check primary sources. They don't go back to the paper. They don't go back to see what the actual conclusion of the science was. They just read the regurgitated headline written three times over. So this is not even a new problem for society. It's just a problem that's getting more urgent because of the nature of the chatbot and its potential for explosive use, explosive adoption. All right, Villas, I'm going to kick to you. What are your thoughts on chat GPT, search engines, the nature of knowledge, knowledge consumption? <laughs> Off you go. Sure. <laughs> Three minutes, let's do it. <laughs> Look, you asked the question, is the world more Black Mirror or is it Star Trek? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one of the great frustrations of my life in these conversations is I think we all aspire to be Captain Kirk and we're weighed down by a lot of Spocks. I'll tell you what I mean by that. I have a vision for a future where AI does all of those amazing things that we want to believe is possible, that makes us more creative, that makes us more inspired, that lets us connect in ways that we don't even know are possible. And we live in a world where every conversation is how do we make sure that a decision-making engine that's a line of code and a set of models is somehow not going to make sure that we all die. Mm. There's a difference in the conversation. So let me start our conversation about artificial intelligence from a very non-artificial place. My wife's a behavioral scientist, and she often tells me about a fundamental human fallacy that I think about all the time. We're always very confident when we're asked to predict the future, but as it turns out, we always overestimate the amount of change that might happen in one or two years, and we always underestimate the amount of change that might happen in a decade. Why is it relevant for this conversation? Well, sure, ChatGPT or some of its progeny might replace search engines. And I think that's great. Like, good. Like, we get better search, and that'll be wonderful. But let me tell you about something I've been thinking about. You know, I'm a trained lawyer. Mm -hmm. ah, see, usually I get, like, boos and hisses from the crowd. This oh, is a very sorry. friendly Ooh, audience here, right? <laughs> I'm a trained lawyer. When I entered the legal profession, young lawyers who graduated from top schools would get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to go and spend really the first five or 10 years of their career writing briefs, right? To go and research the case law, to come up with an argument, to write a compelling piece of rhetoric that could be submitted to a judge who may or may not read it. Well, it turns out that ChatGPT and the generative models that are coming in the next generation can do this incredibly well. In fact, they can do it so well that you can go to some of these models that are now in kind of demo mode and say, don't just write me a legal brief. Here's the judge that it will be in front of read all of that judge's opinions, understand their writing style, the cases they like, and write me a brief that appeals to them. 
No, I say this to you not because I care at all about you know, lawyers and their very privileged jobs, right? Like, displace all of them, I'll be happy. I say that as a former lawyer. But think about what it means for our fundamental assumptions about this field of study that humans have progressed for a thousand years. And we've just said, for most of the basic tasks in that profession, machines can do it better than people. Mm. So here's my comment to you, right? It's not Black Mirror, it's not Star Trek. Like these metaphors talk about a world that didn't exist five years ago and very likely will in the next 10. What does it mean when all of our assumptions about people and businesses, about groups and tribes, about governance structures and citizens are flipped on their head because these technologies create new opportunities? The conversation we should be having today isn't about ethical AI. It's about how we build a new ethical society where AI changes every assumption we have about power. And where are we going to have that conversation? Wow. My head just <laughs> exploded a little bit. I, I really love the idea that we, I mean, it is a problem, I think, of the field that we talk too much in binaries. We talk, is it good? Is it bad? Are we going to be in utopia or dystopia? And as almost always is the case, it will be somewhere in the middle and it will be unevenly distributed. Like one of my favorite William Gibson quotes, future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Applies to tech, applies to machine learning. I, I'm really unsure what this world that's coming for us will look like, but I love the idea that the job for us to do as ethicists, as people grappling with the issue of machine learning, is to speculate about positive futures and to speculate about what we want these capabilities to make available to us. So I'm gonna sort of pick up a thread from your, from your like little brain dump there, and that's this idea that machines could be more persuasive, that they could sort of interrogate someone's entire line of thinking across their entire life and then come back with an argument that's incredibly persuasive to them, perhaps because it's mirroring them, perhaps because it's giving them sort of exactly what they want to hear. What happens when this is done without a human intermediary and no one really understands, like no one really knows. I was able to write a brief for Navrina and she was incredibly persuaded by it, but there was no human in the loop, essentially. There was no one in the middle sort of like actually coming up with that idea or understanding why it was successful. And is, I mean, I don't want to be too unhappy here, but is, is something lost? Is something gained? Is there, is there a world of machine knowledge that we don't need to access? Like maybe that's a world that we should be talking about. So yeah, what, what is lost, what is gained when machines can do persuasive arguments that no human has like really wrapped their head around or has grokked or gotten into. Like, is, is this a good world? Is this something that we're interested in like um, making available across all these sorts of professions, not just law, but you know, you could imagine this in art, you could imagine this in theater, you can imagine this in, you could imagine the AI that was me five years ago and is now just the robot head sitting here doing a much better job of moderating this panel. Like, You're doing a much better job. Oh, that's very <laughs> kind, completely untrue, but I appreciate it. But yeah, what, how do we feel about this idea of knowledge being generated that isn't ever actually consumed by or understood by people? So as a, I'm a, I'm a tech op optimist, so I do want to lay that foundation, but I also believe that human agency and creativity is going to play a much bigger role in the future mm. than we are attributing to right now. And what I mean by that is all the problems that were discussed in the previous panels and that we are discussing right now from misinformation to fairness to security of these systems to robustness of these systems there's there's a socio-technical aspect which i believe that human oversight and agency is going to play a critical role in mm. so um you know when i think about how do we fast forward to that future two things need to happen and we are seeing that right now first is um, alignment alignment on what does good look like. You know, we all have a sense of, sense of values, whether it's a company value, personal values, regulatory values, whatever those values are, how do we codify them into what we want these systems to do mm. and how they want to serve humanity in the future. And by the way, Credo AI is building tools to codify those values so that we can do assessments of these technical systems so that there is alignment. And then the second thing that needs to happen is something to what Vilas was mentioning. I think there's a translation imperative here. 
you know, when we have these systems so pervasive, like they are, you know, we don't even know where they all are, but they are literally, you know, the infrastructure of our life right now. How do you make sure different stakeholders, whether a technologist or a lawyer or a professor or someone who's just a user, how can we all align on what that system is doing? Mm. So right now, um, I'm spending a lot of time in policy circles, just trying to understand how we are thinking about upcoming regulations. Can we inform them with the technical mindset and technical ways of measures of these systems? So I think as we think about the future, I, you know, I, I do want to ground us in, I think human oversight and agency is going to be so critical in making sure that these systems not only perform, but serve us. Mm -hmm. And the way we will get that, get there is through this alignment and translation imperative. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm actually curious, I, I want to 30 to you in just a moment, but I, I want to pick your brain on one more thing related to this, which is, when you think about this question of alignment, writing policy, working out, you know, like the computer logic, essentially, of what is fair, what is good, how do you think about multiculturalism and pluralism? How do you allow for all different kinds of cultures, different kinds of moral values, different kinds of ways of being, so that we don't sort of increase this existing technological colonialism that's already happening where one set of values, one way of thinking about the world is sort of generated in a lab in San Francisco and then you know, propagated across the world. Like, is this something that you've thought about and do you have any ideas on how that might look? Ah, absolutely. I think it's, um, you can apply a very engineering mentality to it or going back to first principles. I don't think you can come up with a definition of fair that aligns with all three of us right here, right? So I think, but there is going to be this multi-stakeholder conversation that we are having right now, but also showcasing how that multi-stakeholder conversation results in um, you know, measures and metrics that you can actually take to technical systems. Mm -hmm. So I do want to give you an example. There's this huge debate right now around what does loss mean, right? Loss in artificial intelligence means a very different thing than what loss might mean to you as a citizen mm -hmm. to what loss might mean to you as a lawyer. So right now there's this coming together of what does it mean within the context of use and can we align what the intent of that AI system was to how it is going to be utilized? And I think those conversations will result in informed policy making. Mm. I'll throw to you, Maroon. Do you want to chat to, I mean, any of the topics Narvina brought up really, but the, we can circle back to the sort of intention of meaning and knowledge production or how do we do alignment? I'm, I'm just going to let you riff. Off you go. Yeah, I mean, I think the alignment problem is a critical problem, but it ultimately brings up the deeper issue, which is one of governance. Who gets to choose? And so what we have right now is a bunch of companies are choosing, basically, what the choices are for things like fairness, what the choices are for how information is provided, and there's no external governance mechanism there, right? If you don't like, for example, how OpenAI presents information to you, or you think there's a particular slant, you have no recourse other than to not use it. And the not use it trope is a standard trope that's used in in most products in computing, which is just completely a red herring, right? Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, if you don't like Facebook, if you think it you know, provides misinformation, don't use it. I don't get inoculated from the effects of Facebook on our democracy if I don't use Facebook. So the idea of individual choice is just completely a red herring. It makes no sense, but it's the narrative that essentially is pushed in the tech sector because it's all about freedom and choice. And what we need to think about is what does it mean in terms of collective action? How do we get regulation? How do we get stakeholders to the table in terms of a governance process that says we absolutely have to have guardrails. Those guardrails have to be determined for us by the plurality, by societies in the particular states, regions, countries, whatever the case may be, that govern that technology. And we need to put in some what we think are the actual principles. So I teach a class with two other people, one of whom is a moral philosopher and one of whom is a public policy person, and I'm the technologist. And the reason the three of us teach it together is because we realize no one has the right answer. Right, the ethicist can talk about here are ethical principles, what does that mean with respect to the technology? Right, the technologist can say here's what the technology is capable of, how does that translate into public policy and actually getting through the gears of government to turn that into a policy that makes sense? So you need to have those different representations at the table, you need to understand what are the value trade-offs, and the critical thing is the value trade-offs are not absolute, and oftentimes we cast them that way. Right, so privacy, we think, I uh, take an absolutist notion to privacy. 
you know, I'm going to have end-to-end -end encryption. No one can get at my information. That sounds great as a consumer until the same people are using that end-to-end -end encryption are people like child pornographers and human traffickers. And at that point, you say, there's a value tension here, and I need to think about how does our society want to resolve that value tension rather than just having one company or a small group of executives make a decision for everyone else. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, that deserves a clap. Love it. It's really good. I'm just going to let you go. All right, let, let me pick up on that. I think that last point is the key one. So, 100 years ago, something really special happened in human history, right? The convergence of a new kind of science around global health, the identification of germs, of antibiotics, of vaccines, incredible human technological progress, and a public realization that public health was a thing, that public institutions should take a role in responsibly deploying them, that we should build everything from national research development facilities to hospitals that were owned by the public, massive nonprofits that focused on the full composition of public health. It was incredible. Now indulge me in a thought experiment. Think about a world in which we had had that, and we had had a conversation like this around ethical healthcare. And we'd said, you know, private companies are absolutely going to be drivers of innovation. But there's a public responsibility around things like making sure that insulin is available to every person on the planet. Making sure that when we have a COVID pandemic, a company can't by itself decide to change the cost of a single COVID vaccine from $16 to $130, as happened last week. Think about a world in which we said, there is an ethical framework in which private organizations can absolutely innovate, but there's public responsibility to make sure that we uphold common shared values around human dignity. That's the conversation we're having right now around AI. Do I trust that any one company will build AI tools that somehow put human welfare at the center of their work? I'm sure there will be companies that do that. Do I trust that the sector will do that? Maybe we should all be a little bit more involved. So where's the space for new institutions that protect human equity in a digital era? Where do we have algorithmic oversight and audit enabled by private companies, but run by humans who are valuing things like participation and inclusivity? I'll give you a very brief example. Think about new algorithms that are being used for hiring. Well, we all want to critique these algorithms as if they're somehow unfair. But let me suggest, these algorithms are trained on data sets of how human recruiters hire. We find that an algorithm has a bias around gender. We look back at the data and say, actually, organizations have a fundamental problem. They discriminate against women. So why not take all this time we're spending analyzing an algorithm and go back to fundamentals and say, why is it that we're okay with the fact that our institutions propagate inequity in this way? Mm -hmm. So to me, this isn't a conversation to say we shouldn't be talking about AI. It's actually something quite larger. AI actually gives us insight into our own behaviors in ways that let us, excuse me, uncover the fundamental biases of the society we built. Yeah, and puts pressure on those biases because of the possibility of the scale, because of the possibility of accelerating and amplifying those existing biases. One of the interesting things about statistical models in general is that not only are they pattern matching machines, not only they see patterns in the data and, and like recognize them and label them, they always amplify them. This is a map territory problem. Models are always a simplification of the real world and nuance is lost. And so what that means is when these these models are applied in the real world, are making real world decisions, we're losing nuance. And when that nuance is important and subtle, or when that nuance is we had a slight gender bias and now we have an extreme gender bias, this really starts to feel like a problem we have to grapple with. So in some ways, I feel that this AI AI sort of generative models, other kinds of like image models, language models, is an opportunity for us to step back, look at the world that we're in, assess it, and decide which bits we want to cherry pick going forwards and which bits we want to leave in the past. We only have a few minutes left, so because I'm, I'm, I'm also a technological optimist and because honestly, I don't want to end on doom and gloom, it's a Saturday, we all need to have a bit of a cheerful ending, I'm going to invite all of you to just share an AI ethics good news story, like an opportunity, something that went well perhaps from your work or your teaching. I want to hear about what's going well in this field. And Navrina, would you like to give yeah, us a start? Yeah, happy to start. You know, um, I just want to leave you with this message that I think we have more power than we believe we have in artificial intelligence. 
And we've, we are seeing this case in point. We work with financial services, insurance, um, HR, government, very high risk AI scenarios. And what we are finding is uh, the human agency oversight and the governance foundation actually can make sure that this technology serves us well. So for me, I am really excited about the future with the right AI governance in place. Amazing. You know, I would agree. As a technologist, I'm still excited about the future. I you don't want to take away from the possibilities, but I think there's lots of talk about what the possibilities are, which are positive, and so I worry about making sure we mitigate the, the negative impact as much as we can. We're not going to get rid of them all. We need to be realistic about that. It's not going to be a world in which there's no negative impact of AI, but that's the value trade-off. What are we willing to accept? And, and like Vila said, I think all AI really is is a mirror of amplification, like you were mentioning as well. It holds a up to us as a society and says maybe we haven't been doing that great if we have things like data that exhibits racism and and you know gender bias and these other kinds of things but at the same time we need to be willing to when we see things like that right so when you talk about hiring Amazon actually had a system to res screen resumes they try to get the bias out of the system this is one of the most technologically advanced companies on the planet they could not they could not make an unbiased system so what did they do they did the right thing and said we're not going to use AI. And so I think that's one of the takeaways to keep in the back of your mind. Sometimes the right decision is to say no. And for business leaders, that's a tough thing to say when you put a whole bunch of resources into something. But if we're willing to stand up and actually say sometimes that's the decision we need to make when it's the right thing to do, we'll all be better off. Great point. Um, you know, I lead something called the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. We're kind of a new kind of institution that's worth 10 seconds to explain it. We think of ourselves as a 21st century philanthropy. We're probably the largest institution in the world exclusively focused on AI for good. And the starting point in that work for me when we think about ethical AI is an inclusion around the kinds of people who are creating these tools and deploying them at scale. And so I think about our work to build a million new data scientists and AI engineers over the next decade, cited in, not in the global north, but in the global majority. How do we bring black and brown voices to creating these tools? How do we make sure communities are actually owning the deployment of them? And making sure that ethics conversations aren't being held by coders, but are being held by communities as they think about how the tools are being deployed. And I'm a huge optimist about that. I love that. I love the idea that we live in a world where the idea that the community has to say yes, has to give the social license for the thing to be deployed on them is the world we want to be in. I love that. I'm going to offer one last thought experiment to the group as we leave. So we've had a lot of discussion about the challenges of generative AI and the fear of artists in particular losing their jobs, losing, losing their livelihood to these generative models. Well, I'd like to pitch that actually there's a huge opportunity for speculative fiction and for science fiction because as we've said, our data sets are all inherently structurally biased, structurally unequal, and what we need to do as a society is imagine better futures and perhaps even use that fiction to train our models on. So perhaps artists, if you need a job to do, imagine a world we all want to live in and we'll use that as a data set corpora to train our next set of language models on. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate you all being here and thank you to the wonderful panelists. <laughs>